Uh, what we're doing tonight is the continuation of a series of somewhat tightly focused um, slices of business where business and technology intersect. We had a big panel back in March on the future of the book, which is about the future of the book and about newspapers and about anything that's digital and can be published. We're going to continue that series later on in the summer and tonight fits squarely within that theme because uh, the headliner of the show tonight, Gary Reback, has spent the better part of 20 years as an antitrust lawyer, an antitrust litigator, a thinker, a writer, and he's here to talk about uh, the way that antitrust used to shape the industry. You know, there used to be days when IBM and AT&T and ITT and Intel and other companies sort of had that cloud of antitrust prosecution hanging over them or some sort of antitrust litigation. And Gary's argument is that all of that went away at one point, and he's a real veteran of the wars, Lotus, Borland, uh, Microsoft, and others. And uh, his central thesis, I think, is that maybe that isn't such a good thing and that maybe competitive uh, forces and market forces alone are just not enough to do the job. He's been called the protector of the market, the one person who's going to help define antitrust law for the 21st century. And in The New Yorker, he was called a zealot and a quote machine. So we'll see about that tonight. Uh, He's written a new book, Free the Market, which uh, he will talk about tonight, and he, in that he examines what he believes is a, a very disturbing and anti-competitive trend, which is the gradual recovery, recovery by major companies of the ability to dominate their markets and to uh, hurt entrepreneurs and innovation and to damage consumers. And so to say that he believes the government should be playing a much more active role in this area now, in this area of technology and entrepreneurship is definitely an understatement. We're delighted to have Gary in conversation tonight with one of the leading journalists, not just in Silicon Valley, but in the world, Michael Arrington, who's the founder and co-editor of TechCrunch. How many read TechCrunch on a regular basis in here? A lot, almost everybody. Well, of course, Michael, I'm glad you read it too. <laughs> TechCrunch.com has nearly six million unique visitors a month, and the LA Times has described Michael Arrington as the undisputed kingmaker of Silicon Valley internet startups. So it's gonna be a great conversation. If you have question cards in your chairs, write the questions down as they come to you. We'll do Q&A session after they've had a chance to talk a little bit. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Gary Reback and Michael Arrington. Come on up, guys. Thank you. So I got your book. <laughs> are you, are you, do you have copies here tonight uh, for people to buy? I don't know if they're selling them here, but they're going to do a promotion with TechCrunch, as I understand uh, it. Yeah, I think so. I was, I, I was actually hoping you'd sign it. Uh, and I was actually hoping you'd sign it now before we do this, because you may not yeah, want to sign it. I think I'll hang on. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it will influence what I say. OK, well. I'll wait on that then. So, yeah, most people don't know, I'm not even sure you know, we, we overlapped a bit. Uh, when you were practicing at Wilson Sonsini, uh, I was there for part of the time. Uh, no, you started practicing law, was it 74? You've been practicing law for two decades, it's almost three. Right? Uh, more than that. So I started there in 1996, so I was a junior, junior associate at the time, and we didn't interact a whole lot because you were a senior, senior partner. Uh, but I, I think, it's safe to say, and you'd probably agree, that I've probably taught you everything you know about antitrust law. You've taught me a lot of things, but that wouldn't be one of them. <laughs> I, uh, oh, I want to read a quote, and then I'm going to let you talk a bit, because this is actually about you and not me tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a quote in the book that, um, has anyone here read the book? One, two. OK, so you, a lot of new readers will come on this. So there's a quote in the book that I think really summarizes sort of everything that you stand for. Uh, in the book, and that's, that's this. Consumers can't depend on the good offices or kindly demeanor of any particular company 
to protect them from exploitation by businesses. Competition is what protects consumers. Competition begets innovation while monopoly begets sloth. As innovation, sorry, and innovation helps consumers in ways far more important than increasing product output. Can you talk a little bit, obviously I think you believe that since you wrote it, I so I don't have to ask you, but can you talk a little <clears throat> bit about why we have antitrust laws, what the history that sort of led to these laws and how they protect consumers? Yeah, I thought I'd, I made actually some notes and maybe I could sort of just set context a little bit and talk for three or four minutes. Uh, you know, our country's been through a lot. Uh, powerful new technologies have transformed the way we live. Uh, they've interlinked separate markets and, and individuals as never before, producing cycles of boom and bust and roiling financial markets. Our nation has seen thousands of people out of work and the rise of powerful financiers, many of whom are clearly corrupt. Uh, people have come to believe that our legislatures are swayed, if not controlled, by the power of big business. People chafe under the control that big oil exerts over our economy. People bemoan the, the control that big business has over our lives, yet there seems to be nothing they can do about it. And by the way, the period of time <coughs> I'm talking about is the 1870s not the past decade. And the technologies I'm talking about are the telephone and the telegraph and the railroads. And the financiers are people like J.P. Morgan, not Bernie Madoff and whoever that guy was who ran AIG into the ground. So we've seen these problems, the problems we have before us today, we've seen them before. Our country survived, our economy survived. How did we do it? When these problems first came up in the 1870s, people were confused, just the way they are today. They didn't really understand how business works. But people quickly came to understand that as business grew bigger and more powerful, that they had to have some protection against the excesses of capitalism. So they wanted the government to grow, to be a foil, to be a counterweight. But that left the question, what exactly should the government do? What role should the government have? And as unemployment increased in the 1880s and got perilously high, a lot of people called on the government to regulate business in a very intrusive way, to set prices, to determine output so there wouldn't be product shortages. But there were other people, journalists, people we now call muckrakers, who took a different viewpoint. They looked directly to the free market for a capitalist solution to the excesses of capitalism. People believed that by forcing companies to compete with each other, that they could curb the power of dominant business interests without curbing economic growth. And so they started passing laws to prevent monopolization and to prevent companies from conspiring with their competitors. And they called this way of thinking antitrust because just about all of the industries at that time had been organized around trustees who ran cartels as disciplined monopolies. So our first law, antitrust law, the Sherman Act, was passed in, in 1890, and it was you know, enforced by fits and starts over the next 100 years. But the thing to keep in mind about antitrust is that it sets the rules of the road. It tells companies how they should compete with each other and then, and this is the important part, and then the government steps aside and lets the companies duke it out in free market competition. Regulation, on the other hand, as I said, intervenes deeply in business. We certainly need regulation in some places to protect our food supply, for example, and to keep bankers having enough reserves so that they don't bankrupt in our entire system. But overall, Americans have come to believe that antitrust and free market competition is the better way to go. It's better, generally speaking, than regulation. It's better than nationalizing our industries that you hear some economists talking about today. Antitrust has turned out to be one of those great American ideas. The Europeans, seeing our success, enacted their own antitrust laws, the same kind of legal commitment to competition, to protecting competition than we have here. 
and the powerhouses of Asia, Japan and Korea, enacted their own antitrust laws. And last year, the People's Republic of China, a centrally planned communist economy on the road to liberalization, enacted a comprehensive set of its own antitrust laws to keep its markets competitive and robust. Now, just one point, and I'll, I'll let you uh, uh, have the floor, Mike, but in my book, in writing my book, I learned a lot. And one of the things I learned is about how much in Silicon Valley, it turns out, we owe to the government. You know, all of, the, all of the technologies in this museum were seeded, I would say virtually all, at one time or another by the federal government. Uh, in the book, I say that Silicon Valley, in many respects, is one large public welfare project. Excuse me? People yeah, don't like talk, to hear let's that. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Go on. But, People yeah. don't like to hear that. It turns out that the federal government even seeded the first venture capital funds, including some funds that are still with us today and making important and robust investments. But the most important thing I learned was how much Silicon Valley owes to antitrust enforcement. Our biggest industries, software and semiconductors, came directly, and I mean directly, from government lawsuits in the antitrust area. A Justice Department lawsuit against AT&T way back in 1956 required the company to license its key innovations for nominal amounts. So there was some guy named Shockley who got a license for $25,000 to the transistor. And that's where we all come from. That's why we're all sitting here today. That's why this museum exists, of course. He set up his own company. His employees didn't like him. They fled and started Fairchild. Fairchild begat Intel and most of the other semiconductor companies you see around here. And a few years later, in the mid-1990s, IBM started selling software separately from its computers in order to avoid an antitrust lawsuit for the government. The government sued them anyway. But before that time, software and computers were bundled together by IBM. There was no separate market for software. Few companies specialized in making software. Separating software from hardware under threat of an antitrust suit was a key element in the creation of the software industry. That's just not my view. That's what the people at IBM said about their decision. So we're here today largely because of antitrust enforcement. I personally think we'll prosper in the future because of antitrust enforcement. And with that as a framework, Mike, so I disagree with everything you said, and I'd like to go on a point by point. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> One of the things I love about the book, just, just to sort of throw a softball, is uh, not even a softball, just a pure marketing pitch, is, is I'm a bit of a history buff, especially in Silicon Valley history, and you talked a little bit there about some of the history of Silicon Valley. This reads like, if you look at sort of the spectrum of quality reading from sort of you know, good fiction on down to, say, antitrust books on the other end, this isn't <laughs> dry and boring. I mean, this actually is a pretty interesting book in, from just sort of talking about the history of Silicon Valley and... Um, that's why I went through it so quickly when I read it. So it's a, it's a really good read. Can I make a comment there? Because I wish yeah. you had talked to my publisher. When I, was, when I was telling my publisher, you know, I want to write a book about entrepreneurs in Silicon yeah. Valley. And they said, nobody will be interested in such a book. I said, fine, it'll be an antitrust book. They said, fine, we'll publish it. I mean, can you imagine that? But the book, yes. the yeah. bo the book yeah. is very much what you say because, you know, we're all about entrepreneurship here. And... I saw some really important entrepreneurs and I saw how they suffered through litigation and through all kinds of problems and that's part of what I wanted to explain. Yeah, okay but, okay, but that's where I'm going to draw a line because, and we'll get to this later, but you, you talk about how great it is to be an entrepreneur, but you also talk in your book about, and you talk briefly about how you need to rip these guys apart once they're successful. I mean, once you've ultimately won, and you've, you've dominated your industry, and there's no one else, you know, sort of there before you, then you come in and rip them apart. I mean, how fun is that? It's just, you know, well, you ripped Microsoft apart. They just never got to the point of ripping it apart, right? So, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. in fairness, talk, yeah. it was a lot of people beyond me, but um, I have a vignette in the book 
where I talk about what my antitrust professor explained to me, my antitrust professor was the head of antitrust during the Reagan administration. Yeah. And he broke up AT&T. And when he was telling us about dominant companies, he told the story of how he thought the system ought to work. This is a Reagan Republican. And he said, you know, once your company, as, as Mike said, dominates a market so that there are no other competitors around, even on the horizon, mm -hmm. the President of the United States invites the CEO to dinner at the White House. State dinner. Uh, 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 wonderful food, toasts by the Secretary of Commerce and the head of the Fed. That night the CEO sleeps in the Lincoln bedroom. The next morning he flies on Air Force One to New York where he has a ticker tape parade down on Wall Street and at the end of the parade the President says, fantastic, you've won. We're breaking up your company into 12 pieces. Which one do you want to run? Now, I don't know that that's my viewpoint, but I could remember that day in class for 35 years, and I could remember it because the professor explained that, what, that, that the nerve center of our capitalist system is competition, or as we like to say in California, the journey is the destination, you know? That's, it's competition that makes the system work. But to answer your direct question, no, I just wouldn't tear somebody apart because they succeed. I don't think anybody else would either. Would, uh, unless they were your client, or your client was on the other side. If you paid me to do it, I might do it, but otherwise, <laughs> no. I want, I want to talk about uh, Microsoft for a bit here in the middle because the, the bulk of your book, uh, or a large part of your book, is about the Microsoft litigation that went on for a long time. Uh, and you were at the sort of there at the beginning and all the way through. Um, it's also a fascinating sort of historical topic at this point. Um, let's start with maybe you could just give us an overview of, of when you started looking at Microsoft for the first time. It was as Netscape's counsel, is that right? No, it was no. way, way before was, that. The first time Microsoft got into trouble was in the Federal Trade Commission. Right. Way back in what, the, er, the late 80s maybe, something yeah. like that. And I you were involved then? Yeah, but okay. it, what was really interesting about that is that people had a lot of complaints, but you couldn't get them on the same page. And as a result, it was very difficult to explain technology in Silicon Valley to the government, and the government yeah. people just spent all their time yelling at each other. Yeah. Well, in, it was 96, 97, yeah, you, started, like you started working with Netscape, and right. the issue then particularly was around the browser. And could you, could you sort of frame that discussion? Because that ultimately led to a lot of the antitrust investigations that yeah, so, uh, so we normally think of antitrust law and economics in, in this area as being about, you know, price and output, right? In other words, the little clip you read, the little excerpt you read from my book, antitrust lawyers think about the purpose of antitrust is keeping output high and prices low. But that's not how we think about it in Silicon Valley. We think about antitrust as keeping the marketplace open for entrepreneurs. And I guess my feeling's always been that if you are a founder and you raise money and you hire management and you produce product, that you're entitled to a fair shot at the market. That customers might not want your product and that's your problem, but no entrenched company should be able to cut you off from getting to the market. And that's really what the Netscape case was, was all about. The theory of the case was that this startup in Silicon Valley had invented some technology that would, in time, or was at least intended to displace the dominant company. And the dominant company fought back in ways that denied market access to the new technology. Yeah. And eventually won, right, in the sense that the, Microsoft was ordered to be broken up, uh, but that never happened. Um, and the browser, even by the time they were ordered to be broken up, their browser dominance was at 60, 70, 80 percent at that point. Microsoft's was. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and so Netscape was sort of history, although they did have a nice $10 billion exit to AOL. I actually, it was the last deal I worked on at AOL. But there's something that I don't quite get. Okay. So prepare for a this missile. Is the, this yeah. is the bad part of having your book read back to you. That, my editor wrote the part that you're... Uh, you're going to read to me. And I told him, yeah. You ready? 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I just, you have to explain this to me. So, okay. uh, let me just read a brief quote. Uh, by the time of the court's decision, I'm not sure what year this was, we're in 90 now? Uh, I'm sorry, 2000 or? But anyway, uh, Microsoft commanded an 86% share of the browser market. Network effects alone could sustain that position against competitors, not to mention Microsoft's physical integration of its browser into its operating system, which further protected the company's browser position from challenge. Uh, so you talked there about, um, it was sort of too little too late. You, you, a lot of this is about the government just, it was way too late by the time the government acted to save your client. Uh, putting that aside, uh, you're arguing here that uh, they had 86% market share uh, and the network effect would sort of perpetuate that. Um, but Microsoft wasn't broken up. And today, we have a situation where Firefox, an open source project, has a significant 20-ish percent share of the market. So were you wrong when your editor wrote this uh, <laughs> in saying that um, they were actually sort of needed to be ripped apart because there could be no competition in the browser market? Given the benefit of hindsight, it seems like there's lots of competition in the browser uh, market. Well, there certainly is. But this, this comment of mine is about what the court said about the attempted monopolization claim. Mm -hmm. In other words, there was a monopolization claim against Microsoft and a monopoly maintenance claim. Yeah. But the claim for browsers was that Microsoft was attempting to monopolize. Right. And the court said, nah, they're not even guilty of attempted monopolization. And I'm saying, you know, their share there, their share there is so overwhelming. Now, later on in the book, I talk a great deal about what's happened in the browser market. Oh, I didn't, I didn't and, read the whole thing. Oh, so. well. And um, I talk about how Google sponsored Firefox. Yep. And how, uh, how that, and, they, and how Microsoft lost control of the space because they were mired in the litigation, basically. And they decided to focus on yeah. the operating system instead of focusing on the internet. So that, that's actually a great segue, segue into my next question, which uh, you do talk about how even the threat of litigation can keep a company maybe from acting further badly uh, and sort of maybe defocusing on, you know, it's just a good thing. So sometimes even the chilling effect in a good way of that, of the litigation or just that there's something going on with the government. Um, and just now you said that maybe that's what helped them defocus enough that, uh, you know, the others were able to enter the market. However, so I have a counterpoint that I'd love for you to explore. Um, when you talk about the original antitrust provisions, uh, we're looking back at oil and, and, and railways and like real stuff, right? Especially when you sort of have all this physical infrastructure that you've created. When you look at the internet, um, a lot of times the incumbents, the ones in the position of market power, almost seem to be at a huge disadvantage. And we see this time and time again where new startups come in and just rip the incumbents apart. Not be, and, and, and even though there's market power on the incumbent side, just because they're nimble and they have better technology and they're not weighted down by their own infrastructure. Don't you think that that is a much better way to regulate the market, just the reality of the situation, than having to involve antitrust laws that are sort of hundreds, of, uh, over 100 years old now and sort of pointless? Well, uh, first, I don't know that they're pointless. I remember a discussion I had with Eric Schmidt when he was explaining to me that how he thought the internet, the best analogy for the internet was the railroads. So I think there's, there's more similarity there than, than you would suggest. But your basic point, wouldn't it be better if new technology overtook old technology? Yeah. Absolutely it would, but you can't expect a dominant monopolist to just sit there. And the question is, what can they do? Yeah. How can they protect their market position without doing stuff that we would consider anti-competitive that actually hurts people? Now, in the examples that you're giving, in my view, it worked out the right way. The new technology yeah. displaced the old technology. That's not what happened, at least for 10 years, right. in, the, in the case of Microsoft. Right. Uh, and they took a competitor out. Th they that's, were the, yeah. that's right. That's right. Now, yeah. you know, these days, I mean, we'll get, to this, uh, we'll get to this probably sooner rather than later. There are other dominant companies in the market, and there are dominant companies in different <clears throat> markets. And people have used a variety of techniques to maintain their, their competitive position. Oracle, for example, did a hostile tender offer, took over, used the legal and financial process to take out its key competitor. Yeah. Okay, that, that to me is not in the public interest, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, who are, you talk about Oracle, let's talk about your top 10 hit list when it comes to bad guys today. 
Uh, well, I don't, course, I don't have, I don't, sure. yeah, this, this sounds a lot like an interview I had to do on Fox where the guy was saying to me, you know, who is it you want to kill tomorrow? Um, I, you do strike fear in the hearts no, of companies. I, God, no, no, not, you not do. remotely. I, I told you this in the green room that I've had this book. I got it in March, and I've had it on my desk. And, and every time a Microsoft exec, which is about once a week, comes into my office to brief us on some new thing that they're, they're doing, they see this book. They always see it. And they go, oh, you have Gary Reback's book. On your, and I'm like, yeah, well, I'm be interviewing him about this. And they're like, uh-huh. And so, I mean, you know, I, I, like that guy. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that that view is universal even in Redmond, but what are the kinds of antitrust issues today that, that are really getting attention? You know, some of them, I mean... Before we go there, because yeah. that's our next big topic. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. You talk in this book, you, you actually quote a lot of discussions you have with clients, and just as a lawyer, how do you get, did you get their permission in all cases, or is it so old now that it... Does it matter? Because there's some really good stuff in here. There's good stuff, but yeah. none of it was confidential. In mm -hmm. other words, the, uh, there was no situation in which it was, a kind of, and I had to go through this with the publisher as well. Yeah. Uh, to give you an example, there, is, there are some discussions that I, I use to talk about uh, uh, a situation involving Hasbro, uh, the toy that's company. Exactly, yeah. The toy company. Yeah. All those. Where, where the CEO had done something, and you're like, oh, undo that. Don't do that. Yeah. yeah. And, so that was yeah. a great discussion. The reason I was able to put that in is because he had to testify about that in okay. court. Okay. So it's all in the public record. It's all fully documented. Okay. And, and so uh, there are a lot of nice stories in here, but none of them are first impression. They've right. all been around in one place or another. So let's, t let's, let's talk about what you just brought up, which is the, the sort of the, the looking forward. What are your concerns? Where do you think antitrust can help improve competition in, in the Silicon Valley marketplace in particular? Yeah, part of, well, let's talk more broadly for a second first. I mean, some of the biggest problems are actually in pharmaceuticals. Yep. Now, pharmaceuticals are, are big for us here, and certainly biotech is very important. And if the big pharma companies back east were buying our biotech startups who really need buying, then that would be great in my view. But instead, they're buying other big companies back east and killing the R&D of both companies. And that's producing high cost pharmaceuticals, <coughs> very little innovation, a lot of problems. There are two big pharma mergers that are pending. And I think those mergers are gonna have problems getting through. Are you going after them? No, I'm not involved. I, I've done some pharma earlier this year, but it was on a good deal and a deal that got through. Yeah. Uh, do big, do, I mean, are, big pharma companies better at making drugs in general? I mean, the the argument that is that they are much worse, at least recently, that you can't just take two R&D teams. You know, if you have 40 people on an R&D project and the company you're acquiring has 40 people on a project, you can't put them together and have an 80-person R&D team. You can have too many smart people working on the same project. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that's intuitive to us out here because our companies are generally smaller and more nimble. And as I say, there is an acquisition path which makes a lot of sense to me, which is these big companies with sales forces and, and so forth buying up the companies who want to be bought up here, uh, out here, these biotech companies, but, it, but they're not doing that. And instead, the biotech companies are suffering from cash and the big companies back east are doing anti-competitive deals. So pharma is a big issue. I think, and I think the government will think it's a big issue. There's another big merger that's pending mm -hmm. that young people care about, and that's the merger between Ticketmaster, the largest ticket seller, and Live Nation, the largest concert promoter. Um, that's an important antitrust issue because the two companies really don't compete with each other. They make complementary products, complementary services, but I think that one's dead on arrival too. I think it's an anti-competitive merger, and I expect any day now, you'll see the Justice Department say, no dice to that one. That has ramifications in the Valley because of how many times we do mergers between companies that make complementary products. Yeah, well, particularly now that the IPO window is yeah, largely Yeah, we, ha we have to. We have to. It's the only way out. Yeah. Right, right. But in this and case... And you want to ruin that for everybody. Yeah, uh, hopefully not. Hopefully I, I, I want to make it uh, a great opportunity you, for you everybody. You will not rise to the bait on anything, will you? No. I well, I think it's important because there are issues that are very concerning. And I think that if I talk about those, I can talk about them sincerely 
and I don't want to get dismissed on some of this other stuff where I really don't think there's much difference between you and me, for no, example. No, but I'm looking for the sound bite that I can turn this into a post, so... <laughs> well, so I, let me give you, so let me give you another, uh, let me give you another uh, issue that I think is, is very important, and that's this Google Books yep. thing. Um, there's not been nearly enough coverage in Silicon Valley about this. I think TechCrunch has actually written about it, what, two or three times now. Yeah. Uh, and the New York Times has covered it and a little bit in the journal, but this is really a, a, a serious issue, a set of serious issues. I thought about how I would explain this in soundbite quality. Uh, well, I told you how to explain it. Which is? We need to rip Google apart. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could just say that. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't think no, so. Could, could you explain the Google Books, sort of the, just frame the... Yeah, I, I actually made a set of notes to try to do this. Uh, but, you know, trying to explain this without putting people to sleep is very difficult. So, so Google started several years ago. Uh, uh, they made the announcement they were going to create a, a library card catalog, a universal library card catalog. They were going to index every book ever written in the United States. And most people like me said, oh, that is great. Can't wait to see that card catalog. And of course, the publishers didn't like it because they wanted to get paid for having their book indexed even. And so they sued Google. And the litigation went on for three years. And during this time, most of us thought that the companies were litigating against each other. But in fact, they were in the back doing mm -hmm. a venture. I don't know what to call it, a joint venture. And late last year, Google announced not a, a card catalog, but a library. A library that's going to contain all the books ever written in the history of the United States from the founding of our republic to the beginning of this year. Many of those books, under the terms of a deal worked out with the publishers, go exclusively to Google. Exclusively. So, Somebody like me, and I would suggest even you, and you can do sound bites here too, we rely on competition to police the market. How in the world are we going to have competition? And it's not just a matter of somebody is going to be paying too much to see books online. It's that Google will have the opportunity to take the information they get and use it to improve their search engine. And they can use it, and they do use it, to improve their network, their social network software to the disadvantage of, of the Facebooks and the MySpaces. And we're going to end up in a situation where poor kids who go to public schools will end up paying money to the billionaires at Google just to look at books online. It's, to me, a crazy situation. So that's under investigation by the Department of Justice. I, I don't know what's going to happen there. <laughs> you, did you just work in, like, but what about the children? As far as I know, it's free, and, and it's ad-driven. Is that right? And 63% so, and of, oh, of the revenue well. goes, towards, goes to the, uh, the authors. 63%? So. No. 63% of the revenue goes to the publishers. Okay. And, and, uh, and they're the ones who've sort of formed this consortium back east. It's not just some of the publishers, Mike, it's all the publishers. Right. All the publishers. It's like, it's as if Steve Jobs, instead of doing what he did with iTunes, got all the, pub, uh, got all the record companies in the room, and the record company said, keep your prices high, Steve, and we'll only deal with you. And of course, Steve did exactly the opposite. And that worked out great. But yeah. that's not what's going on in New York, and that's the part that's but, so really your concern, scary. Your concern is the deal they cut, not the fact, because Google showed real innovation in taking these huge machines that take the books and, and hyperscan them really fast. I mean, they, went, they, they had a significant expense to do that, and, and we can't, we can't, we need to reward companies that take that kind of well, and ordinarily, approach, right? ordinarily that would be true. Yeah. I would certainly agree with you ordinarily, but here, Google is asking the court to change the copyright laws, literally, for its benefit. It's asking the court yep. to give it permission to put books in its library that we don't, the author's dead for, but there's still a copyright. It's asking for an exception. And if it comes back asking for an exception, then it seems to me we gotta, we got to look and make sure there's competition, because if there's not competition, there are going to be real problems in this space. Okay. 
So is one solution to sort of imminent domain the database and give it to access to everybody and let them do whatever well, they want? Well, you would want, I mean, that's, that is part of a solution. The authors and publishers should get paid, instead of getting paid a monopoly rate, which is what they've set up, they should get paid a competitive rate for their books. If you and I both yeah. write books on entrepreneurship, they're supposed to compete with each other. That's how right. our system works. That's not the way this is set up. So you'd have to do a little mm -hmm. bit more than that. And of course, you would have to compensate Google you know, in, in a fair way, right. in a fair way. But again, if they're, if they're going to ask for exceptions to our normal system, then something like what you've proposed is certainly worth thinking about. Is, is this, because I'd like to talk about Google search a little bit too. Sure. Is this their Achilles heel? Is this the, the, the issue like sort of with Microsoft with the browser that could potentially bring them down or, or is it search? Like what do you think is the more important issue from an antitrust point of view? You, when you say search, you mean the fact that they have such a large share in search? Yeah, their search market share is about what Microsoft browser share was when you yeah. ripped them apart in the I 90s. I didn't so. rip them apart. Um, Sorry, did I say that again? Yeah, I must yeah say that. right. The, um, the two issues are related because you remember the most troubling part of Google Books is that they get to use this vast corpus of books yeah. to improve their search. Yeah. So if you're now already concerned about their search size, let's say you're concerned about it, but you don't want to rip them apart. Right. You'd like to try to see what the free market would do. Yeah. You know, you'd like for Carol Barch to succeed. You'd like for even Microsoft to do better since they're plowing all this money into the space because you, you want there to be competition. <coughs> In that situation, you would be very concerned that they not get any unfair advantage someplace else that would help search, right. given their large share. Right. So it seems to me, if you're, if you're worried about search, you look at things like Google Books, I don't think anybody's going to just start off going at them because of their search share, because generally speaking in this country, we, we are troubled by things you do, not by your success. We're troubled right. by things that you do to get an unfair advantage, not things that you do to get a large market share and to make money and stuff like that. So what I see, I see their tension points as being places like this where they start doing things that are a little different. From, you know, for example, Eric Schmidt sitting on Apple's board. Right. Now, now, why is he sitting on Apple's board? I mean, is it plausible to suggest the two companies don't meaningfully compete with each other? Shouldn't they compete with each other? They do compete with each other. And, sh yeah. and shouldn't they? I mean, we're all yeah. counting on great competition in phone space and on online video and all those other kinds of things. I can't even understand why they're fighting that. So you, I, it's just yeah. mysterious to me. I, sure. I don't understand why they wouldn't, you know, they're just sort of... So Apple's on the list too. I've got Oracle and Google no, and Apple. No, Apple's not on the list. <laughs> Apple's not on the list. What phone do you have, by the way? You yeah. have a Blackberry, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, lawyer, yeah. Right. Um, do you think, I want to talk more about search because we're not diving into it deep enough. Do you think, let me frame it differently. You talk about just winning isn't enough. It's winning and then doing other things to keep your win, your, your lead right. that are sort of right. wrong. But if you look at search, search is sort of like, okay, whatever. But search marketing is like half the advertising revenue from the internet. And the right. internet's taking a bigger and bigger share of overall advertising right. in the world. So we're talking about, when you talk about search, you're talking about tens of billions of dollars in revenue. Um, I'm concerned, and I was concerned last summer when Yahoo and Google uh, entered into an agreement to sort of merge their search and work together on that. And I, and I wrote, and took a lot of hits for this, I just wrote, this is wrong because we need competition in search. Was that sort of something that you would describe, that deal, as something wrong, like maybe it potentially was something where they're trying to take an unfair lead, or what other things do you, no, you see I happening? Think that, I think, it, I remember reading that piece that, that you did, and I, it was, it, what you had to say, as a matter of fact, was very similar to what, uh, in that little snippet that you read in my book at yeah. the beginning. Uh, the only thing I would add is we, we need competition in search, and we need competition in all the other markets as well. But particularly in search, because it's seminal, because it drives revenue, because, because of all the, thing, all the reasons you can think of and, and what you laid out in that TechCrunch piece. That was a problematic deal, wasn't it? I mean, that was, that was uh, uh, concerning for the reasons that you suggest, but I think what ultimately killed the deal 
was that advertisers were worried, they couldn't quite understand how the advertising engine works because yeah. Google really won't tell you how it's the advertising. It's a black box. It's a yeah. black box. So they <coughs> figured that if one company had so much control yeah. that they could get disadvantaged without even knowing it. Right. And, and that's, what, that's the reason eventually and, the government came down to And there's an incentive to disadvantage because it's a black box. Indeed. Yeah. You have to trust completely that Google's doing Indeed. the right thing. And, yeah. and that's what's, you know, how different is that from trading in derivatives, right? I mean, yeah. in other words, it's a little scary when we sit here looking at the search market because it's so important to all of us. And unlike even operating systems, it is not transparent to us. We don't really know how it works. We don't know what a company could do to manipulate it if they wanted to. Our, our, really, our only protection is what you suggest, to have several robust <coughs> competitors in the yep. space and then hope and trust that they will offset each other's economic power. Yeah. So, so long story short, that Yahoo situation was exactly the kind of additional thing yeah. which I think the government really has got to put brakes on particularly in this market for which the reasons you suggest, which, yeah, which they, they did. did. Even, even the Bush administration that had, that had not brought a single case in eight years against a dominant company, and only three merger cases in eight years said that one was wrong. Okay. Um, do you think, uh, do you think, if you're looking back at, at Microsoft, uh, do you think that it would be a better world if Microsoft had been broken up into multiple companies uh, at the time that the, you know, sort of when the order went through? No, I really don't. Yeah. And, and what's interesting about this is I think you will look in vain. My job at the time to, was to get the government to file suit. Yeah. And, and as I explain in the book, generally speaking, that's enough. Because once the company gets encumbered in that suit and everything else, other companies can come to the fore and can yep. compete. They, they lose the kind of, of preclusive domination that's, that's bad. Just because the government gets in their head. And well, that's what happened in that case. And yeah. the, uh, you know, I quote a guy from IBM who was talking to me about it, saying, you know, the same thing happened to us. You know, we swore, yep. we swore we wouldn't get diverted from our attention to the market. And of course, and of course, of like course we did. Yeah. So I never, that I can recall, took a position on what the correct remedy was, because frankly, I didn't care. It wasn't necessary to me to complete you know, my side of the project. Well, OK, you say you don't care. And I can make a quip about, well, that's because you, you know, your clients stopped paying you. But I'm not going to make that <laughs> quip because you do care. I mean, anybody that reads the book, I mean, there's a lot of passion in this. I mean, more passion than you'd expect when talking about antitrust. And yeah. you, you really believed in what you were doing. Oh, yeah. But, but, and I believed that the market had to open up for startups. And I believed yeah. we had to keep the, the, the internet open, you know, we didn't know about search at the time, for example. I mean, we knew right. there were search companies, but we didn't know it would be a platform in the way it is. But we could all imagine that there would be new technologies that if, if the market were sufficiently freed up, those technologies could take hold and, you know, and blossom and mature and so forth. So yeah, I felt strongly about that. It's just that I, you know, the exact remedy you needed to get that result wasn't, wasn't part of my mix. Okay. So it was enough to get in their head and everything kind of worked out fine. Well, there is a portion in the book where I talk about how they reacted. And yeah. it's not really my work. I mean, some of the work was done in a book by a Wall Street Journal uh, writer named David Bank. And there are these famous uh, Halloween memoranda where, where w that, that suggest that Microsoft was thinking about doing things, similar things on the server side and on the internet yeah. side, but because of the pendency of the case, didn't do it. Okay. And, and, you know, that to me is a resolution of the problem, basically. Can you talk about Europe for a second? Uh, it, it, just curious, when I look at what happens in the world, the U.S. comes in and regulates monopolies and brings cases, and then Europe and apologies to the Europeans in the audience, but it seems like they just sort of come in later and then you know, play the bully role. And I've written a couple of posts about how they see Microsoft as an ATM machine. It's like every couple of years yeah. they withdraw a couple billion dollars yeah. just because they have a budget shortfall. 
I'm exaggerating the point, but do they really do anything other than take money from U.S. companies? Yeah, well, yeah, I can't bite on that, but I will say that... Um, <laughs> That um, so you'd agree that it, they're pointless. Uh, no, I, would, I wouldn't agree that they're pointless. <laughs> but, but but to give an example that that you will like, I got a call from you know a, a writer from one of the London-based big financial newspapers, and he's saying you know, don't you think it's a little bit kind of what you're? Did you think it's a little bit silly that the Europeans want Microsoft to carry Google's browser, you know, yeah. and must carry on Google's browser? Well, yeah, it is. It is a little silly, isn't yeah. it? Uh, uh, so that that does strike me as a little out there. However, they have done a lot of good work within Europe uh, on their public utilities, uh, on reducing monopoly costs in their public utilities, on merging their various disparate markets. They've been very, very successful in Europe at a time that we weren't, mm. and unfortunately, that got them out ahead of us and and unfortunately during the bush period of time communications weren't good with them so so this is them true. being europe them being yeah. the european enforcers <laughs> yeah. and as a consequence I, I don't think that we could have the kind of dialogue which would have turned off some things that maybe you think should have been turned off yeah because the perception of the europeans were that that we weren't doing anything Right. And they needed to do something. Right, because they had budget shortfalls. Oh, I don't think that's true. But, <laughs> but they, needed, they, they felt they needed to protect their own consumers. Sure. sure. And they felt that we weren't doing anything. Had we been doing more, and had we been able to constructively can say to them, the right way to do this we think is X, not the right way to do this is not to do anything, right. then I think we would have had a more constructive dialogue and things would have worked out okay. better. Uh, so one other topic I want to cover before we go to questions. Um, the idea, this is not covered in your book, but it's an interesting topic. The idea of too big to fail is very right. relevant in our economy right now. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that in the sense that sort of these sort of constant stream of government bailouts of industries and companies that we cannot live without. What are your, what are your feelings on this from a competitive standpoint and, and the health of the marketplace? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to publicly embarrass you by agreeing with you. Uh, I, I, um, that doesn't too big to fail. Because I think some companies are too big to fail. Well, they, they are too big no, in, the, in, the, in the sense <laughs> that they'll ruin the world for the rest of us. But the question is, how do they get too big? Right. I mean, what in the world were we doing? What were you doing? Well, I was writing a book. <laughs> but, you know, what were we doing when we let AIG take over this market and get so interconnected that when yeah. they failed, all the rest of us failed? You know, the right kind of market for me is you have four or five competitors. If one screws up, it's his problem. Yeah. But in a market with one company, if it screws up, it's my problem. Yeah. And so to, to me, and I think to the, to the new head of antitrust who's made a speech in, to this effect, what we're seeing now represents a failure of our competition policy. And what's worse is that we keep letting these companies get bigger, yeah. right? I mean, the solution we seem to yeah. think is to let them acquire the next company over and then we bail out that and then they acquire the next company yeah. over. And there doesn't seem to be any kind of exit strategy. Yeah. And even the Wall Street Journal editorial page was saying maybe the solution to Citigroup is to break up Citigroup. You know, yeah. and I think the Journal would prefer that they break them up themselves and I've yet to see, see a CEO other than the guy, AT&T guy who would break up his own company. Yeah. Nevertheless, wouldn't we be better off with competition where we can have it as opposed to, to thinking that we can regulate these vast international behemoths in markets like black box mar markets like derivatives that we really don't even understand? Right. You know, so I guess I'm with you on that one. Uh, it strikes me as, as a difficult policy. I can understand why the administration would do it in the short term, because they got this terrible problem, and you do whatever you can to keep the economy afloat. But as a longer term, strat as a longer term strategy, man, that's, that's kind of scary. Ready for questions? I'd just like to make one other point. You yeah. know, where does too big to fail take us? Where does it take us in the software market, for example? A uh, uh, question I'd pose to you is, is Oracle too big to fail? I mean, suppose Oracle literally failed and it brought down the back office in, you know, the Fortune 2000 companies. That, to me, would be catastrophic. It would be awful. 
So, you know, what should we do about that, if anything? Well, the answer is probably nothing, but it's, it's something worth mentioning. So I'm not even listening anymore. These questions are really good. Yeah, they go on in the back, in the front. God. I, just, I need this quote, though. Will you just say, just say it. Just say, for the sake of the children, we need to break Google apart. <laughs> just say it. For, for the sake of the children, I will say, for the sake of the children, we okay. need to look at Google Books really hard. Okay, that's fine. Now say, we need to break Google apart. And I can splice that together later. Uh, so, questions. I get to pick them. Yeah, well, that's the tough thing. I'm going to find ones that are on my side. You got another pile oh. over here. Okay, here's one. Um, how would you compare the role of an antitrust system with that of referees in sports? Well, the theory, the theory is the same. I mean, you're not supposed to influence the outcome of the game, right? If you're a referee, you're supposed to enforce the rules, but the better play is supposed to prevail. And that's the way it is with antitrust. I never thought of that analogy. I would have put it in my book. You know, but it is, but it is, an inter it is kind of an interesting analogy. You're doing more than calling balls and strikes. You're really like a basketball referee. You're affecting the flow of the game. But you're trying to affect the flow of the game to keep players from doing things that keep, that stop the better team from winning. And I know that's a sentence with triple negatives, but I think you get my point. That is what an antitrust enforcer is supposed to do. So it's an interesting idea. And, and if somebody didn't sign that or copyright it, I'm going to use it in my next book. Ra raise your hand if you um, wrote that question. You can get credit. Um, <laughs> Here's one, I didn't know this. Uh, did the EU or EC, I guess, I know that, uh, just find Intel 1.5 billion for anti-competitive practices? Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you just missed that one? That was about I, a month yeah. ago. So that's just, you know, we talked a little bit about that, but that's more of the ATM machine stuff, so uh, that person agrees. Yep. Um, here's, a, here's a really good one. Who protects us from the government's quest to control more and more of the American economy? Autos, finance, healthcare, et cetera. Who breaks up, you know, the government when they get too much too no, involved? I, in this you stuff? know, <laughs> we have some libertarians in the audience. Yeah. Um, as I've said, I do agree with the, the the part of this question that that focuses on regulation to the exclusion of uh, fostering competition. I think I really do think that that's a mistake. Now, some of this other stuff, I mean, I'm not, I'm a subscriber to the notion of effective government, which, frankly, big government has a problem being effective. And smaller government, better targeted to take care of problems, might do actually a much better job. Getting from the sprawl to something more effective, given entrenched interests and, you know, all the campaign contributions, that's a very, very difficult problem. And happily, it's beyond the province of my book or my knowledge. There is some exceptionally atrocious handwriting in this. And then there's some that's really, really good, actually. Um, th this one, I don't, I don't get this one. You've not mentioned the world's largest computer company. Do you know who that is? Who? Uh, I, OK, I, like I give up. Question. Huh? I feel like it's a trick question. Oh, yeah. You want to rip them apart? Are they on the top five uh, list? No, and as a matter of fact, they're an interesting example. You know, think about rich people, powerful people, influential people for whom there are no antitrust complaints, like, say, Warren Buffett. I mean, why is that? Well, for example, he bought the third largest insurance company and invested heavily in it and promotes competition in those markets and makes a great return. Uh, Hewlett Packard the same. Now they dominated printers for a while, but you know Hewlett Packard was an institution, is an institution in Silicon Valley, and they're generally thought of in a very different way. And frankly, they just don't seem to spark these kinds of things if they have the kind of market power that people are concerned about, which I don't know that they do, but people don't seem to, to chafe under it in any respect. Oh, here's a good question, actually. We, we had talked about this as a possible topic. I didn't get to it. Um, Gary, hasn't the system, in this case the courts, undermined another foundation of competition and entrepreneurship, patents, in the last few years? 
uh, and he said, uh, he said something, something versus SanDisk. I don't know, maybe you can see the bottom. Well, there is a, yeah, there, there is yeah. an important SanDisk, uh, yeah. Metamune, Stimco and SanDisk, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, patents are an interesting question. And part of, part yeah. of my book is I don't, I deal with patents, deal with it is not quite the right word, but I talk about patents in one chapter, but I have three chapters leading up to that chapter where I talk about copyright because it's the same kind of problem. There are people, probably people in this audience who do startups who think that they have to have patents, otherwise they'll get run over by these bigger companies, and, and that is likely true. There are other people in the same audience with the same kind of companies who say that big companies who have patents are rolling all over them every day, and why doesn't somebody stop the government from issuing all these bad patents? And you know what? They're probably right, too. Um, trying to unpack the patent system is difficult. We have way too many patents that are lousy. Bad patents should never have been issued. They're sitting out there. They are used against people because of the sheer mass and weight of them. Yeah. They clog the channels for entrepreneurs, and they make it increasingly, you know, when I started out here, when I started out here, the last thing, the VC, bad patents should never have been issued. They're sitting out there. They are used against people because of the sheer mass and weight of them. Yeah. They clog the channels for entrepreneurs, and they make it increasingly, you know, when I started out here, when I started out here, the last thing the VC needed to know about was your patent portfolio, because frankly, they didn't care. Right. It didn't make any difference to your success. And, and I think that was, frankly, a good period of time. I think that people understood what they needed to do to succeed. Now, we can't operate without patents, of course. But we're, I think we are, we are overboard. We don't, we don't have enough support for the good patents, and we have way too much support for the lousy patents. Antitrust, I think, is going to try to start limiting this. I mean, the, pat, the Supreme Court tried to cut back on this in a case <coughs> or two. We're going to see the antitrust authorities come into some of these patent settlements and try to shut down what they think are anti-competitive patent licensing deals that are done as part of, of patent settlements. Let me just give one example. When I talk about this, people don't believe it. But in the, in the pharma area, it is now common for a brand name company to attract generic competition. And when the brand name company attracts the generic competition, if their patent hasn't expired, they sue on the patent, even though it might be a flimsy patent. And then they say to the generic manufacturer, and by the way, how about if I just give you a couple hundred million dollars and you just go away? And I'll continue to sell at my high price and you don't come into my market for the next four years. Mm. It sounds unbelievable, and yet that is now happening every day. Even the Bush administration tried to get it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court most recently, last week, declined to hear a case where the FTC was challenging that kind of behavior. I expect, and that, that behavior, that kind of behavior affects our healthcare system. It takes money out of our economy. It's, it, it, it is being criticized by people from the right like Orrin Hatch, and from the left like Henry Waxman, and yet we can't seem to fix it. So I expect to see antitrust coming down hard on that stuff. Uh, I was gonna say something about the uh, health, you tying healthcare into the whole thing, and then I realized it was relevant because of the return on drugs, but I thought we first we had the children, now we have healthcare. Yeah. So. Uh, there was a guest, I think we already talked about this, but it's interesting. There was a guest post on TechCrunch that compared Google's current consolidation of access to advertisers with the Sabre reservation system uh, to consolidation of access to travel agencies and consumers. Uh, he says, Michael, but we'll ask you, do you agree with this analogy, and should Google be broken apart? Uh, I think you've answered the second part in the affirmative, so the question is... Well, wait, wait a minute. This question was directed to you, right? right? So you keep asking me to bite well, off on the issue of so whether you, Google should be broken apart. This asks you, do you think Google should be broken apart? Absolutely not. But I would love it if you said that. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, 
but I'll tell you, I actually didn't read this post, so I actually am not even sure. I don't know if I agree. I don't know a thing about Sabre. Uh, yeah. Sabre was a, a reservation system originally set up yeah. by American well, Airlines. Is, but yeah, yeah. but yeah. it wasn't, even in its day, it controlled airplane seats, right? Yeah. Think of everything that search controls. It controls, as you pointed out, a lot of the money that flows through yeah. the tech sector, or in every sector, all of advertising for that yeah. matter. Uh, what about, this is for the libertarians, uh, what about the fact that the state is the ultimate monopoly? Should we break up the state? We already had that question, but let's, I mean, just great. So you're saying no to that. Uh, I, Don't want uh, re revolution is not on my agenda. <laughs> you should deal with that one in Iran. Uh, we're not going to talk about that. Um, I think it's a good one to end on. It. Uh, you, you, I'll paraphrase a little bit. You mentioned antitrust laws are several decades old. Given your acknowledgement of similarities in the old industry, railroads, et cetera, to the new economy and high tech, uh, what and how should we ensure, uh, how should antitrust laws be changed to adapt? Yeah. I, you know, there was this big commission that was set up at taxpayer expense a couple of years ago to study this question. And I had advocated that they do nothing, and after a couple years of study and thousands of hours of hearing, they did literally nothing. Of course, it cost the taxpayers a ton of money. Antitrust law is basically made on a case-by-case -case basis through the courts. If you go back to, to the bedrock principles that we've talked about here, the protection of competition, the need for competition, competition as a sustaining force in our economy, if you apply those basic principles to each new technology or industry that comes along, you'll do fine regardless of what the language of the law is because the language of these laws is sort of vague in general anyway. So, uh, thank you. Um, when I asked at the beginning how many people have read the book, two people raised their hand. How many people are now going to go out and buy this book? Well, we're, we're, we're up to a 30% a, increase. A, a I, can, yeah, I count of 50 people, and I should get 10% of any gate. Yeah. So, um, I'll talk to my publisher. So thank you. And also thanks to HBS Tech and the, and the Computer Science Museum, and, uh, Computer History Museum, uh, for having me. And it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to, to interview you today. Please Thank join you, me in thanking these two guys for uh, a great evening. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Will you, will you, you could, could you stay put, uh, Michael, could you and, and Gary just stay put for just a second? We have, first of all, we have a gift for both of you. This is a, this is a kind of a tradition here at the museum uh, for people who come and speak. This is a book called Core Memory which uh, contains just beautiful photographs taken by Mark Richards yeah, of yeah. many of the, the items in our collection. And you'll see it's, uh, they're, they're beautifully artistic and it's a wonderful book. So just please accept that as a little token of our thanks for being with us Thank tonight. You. So let me give you just a